From the Time Center in New York City, City University Television, in association with the New York Times, presents a Times Talk series with editors and writers of the New York Times. Today's presentation, a conversation with Michael Stipe, Times interviewer Hugo Lindgren. Good evening, everyone. I'm Carol Olson Day of the New York Times, and I am so excited to welcome you to this Times Talks tonight. We are delighted to have on our stage a remarkable talent. His band, REM, has sold over 100 million records and is a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. The band's website has won awards worldwide. He has founded two film production companies and produced more than 20 feature films, including the Oscar-nominated Being John Malkovich. He's also an author, a photographer, and a sculptor. As Interview Magazine said, he might be the American independent culture's only certifiable rock legend, so original and inimitable that no similar career comparison can be found in the arts. And he actually is still in the process of defining what that legend is. He recently curated a series of 12 short films accompanying each track on REM's current album, Collapse Into Now. The films, which have been on exhibit at the Clock Tower Gallery downtown, and some of which you'll see here tonight, were imagined and directed by 12 diverse artists, each with their own unique perspective. And as he told tonight's moderator for an article on the band in the Times Arts and Leisure section in 2003, we're artists. We want to continue to be relevant. We don't want to get stagnant. And if it happens, we want to be the ones to realize it. We don't want to have to be told. Somehow, I don't see him having to be told, ever. Our moderator is also someone who's kept changing over the years. In October, the Times lured him back to our fold to become the new editor of the New York Times Magazine, where he had been a deputy editor in the 1990s. Ever since the start of the year, the magazine has been evolving under his direction to be the conversation starter for a new era. Previously, he was executive editor of Business Week and before that, editorial director of New York Magazine for six years. We're so glad he's back. Please join me in welcoming Hugo Lindgren and our very special guest, Michael Stipe. <laughs> Thanks very much. Hello, everybody. Hi. Um, this is Michael Stipe. Hello. <laughs> um, I'm going to say a few things that will be probably embarrassingly obvious, certainly to Michael, but also to everyone here, too. But I have to say them because there has to be an introduction. Um, so uh, I was a somewhat young person when I first heard um, REM. At the same time, Michael was also a young person. Um, and they were part of an era. It was, I just actually, I just saw on Twitter that uh, REM turned 31. Uh, in April, so That's you played right. your first date in Athens, Georgia, in a church 31 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and they were part of a, a, a sort of era where the bands kind of broke down the boundaries between the fans and the band. And so to, to love the music of R.E.M. was to feel like you were sort of a part of R.E.M. Um, and that was true of uh, a number of really great bands of that era. But what really distinguished R.E.M. Um, is that over the years they became quite a popular band. Um, and they never lost that kind of um, connection to their fans. So that uh, as they um, went on to become one of the most popular bands in the world in the 90s, they still had um, that sort of core um, uh, relationship with, with their fans. And I, I think it's, um, I think it's, really, it, it's, it's really the only um, situation like that in all of popular music that I'm aware of. Um, and it's, uh, it ma it's what makes people feel so strongly about the, the work they do. Um, for better and, and uh, for worse. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It has, it has some, you know, counter effects. But in any case, um, what we're going to be talking about tonight uh, primarily is uh, R.E.M. just released 
um, their 15th studio album, um, Collapse Into Now. And as part of that, um, they've, uh, Michael has, uh, has worked with uh, 15 different directors, well, 10, including yourself. Yeah. Well, 10 in addition to yourself. I don't really have to work with myself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, one of which we'll be, we'll be seeing uh, Michael's video uh, or film tonight, and we're going to start in a little bit showing the films and talking about them, um, but we're going to talk a little bit first. Um, let me start by saying, so the album came out a month ago, a month and a half ago? I think two months, two almost months, two months, okay. yeah. And the, typically when an album comes <laughs> out right about now, you'd be in a hotel room in Tulsa <laughs> having a nap, ready to go on stage later that day, and this time you're doing something different, so why are you doing this way? I didn't want a tour. Uh, and uh, the, the band kind of agreed that that's not what we wanted to do behind this record. And um, I, I'm really happy to um, have worked on th these films and to have, th this is I think the third or fourth event that I've done uh, kind of around the world where I'm talking about the idea of pulling um, uh, an album out of the 20th century and trying to make it uh, something, my voice just got a lot louder. So trying to make it something that's, uh, that, that's more current uh, and not, you know, if you're talking to an 11-year-old, it's hard to kind of describe what, what it was to listen to an album in the 1970s when I was a teenager. And um, so I wanted to kind of, using the available technology to kind of address that now and try to present something that um, would pull people into the idea of, of not a single song or idea, but, uh, but a, lo a body of work that, that artists can, are able to create within a space of time. And present. Now, is this an idea you had, like going into the recording of the album? Were you pretty sure that's what you wanted to do, or did it evolve as you guys got together, produced the album, and decided that you weren't going to tour, that you were going to do this instead? How did, where did it sort of come up in the process? It's something I've been uh, talking about for a long time, but it, it's a lot harder, especially if you're mounting a tour and all the stuff that goes with that. That's a year of work, at least behind the scenes, before you ever play the first show. But I, it's something that I've been talking about doing for for a long time. Um, and uh, we're not the first band to do it. We're not the first uh, people to have uh, commissioned or work with uh, people to do a, a film or a, a video or a, a, some kind of visual element to an entire album. But um, but this feels to me distinctly 2011, and and that's what I like about it. Now, what is the difference now? When when I was first uh, uh, listening to REM, right around that period, MTV was this sort of giant. Mm -hmm cultural force and it was mm. music videos at the time and so that there was a place to see and at the very early days that wasn't something that REM did a lot of and were <coughs> distinguished for although they became so later on. Yeah. But what's the difference between what you're doing now and what was shown on MTV in the, you know, in 1987, 1991? Well, I was a little slow to come to that uh, uh, table <laughs> and I, I remember a conversation with Miles Copeland um, right after the band signed, Miles Copeland, uh, was, the Miles Copeland was the head of uh, IRS Records, oh. which was the first label that, that REM signed to in 1982, I think. And um, he brought me in and said, you know, there's this amazing thing, MTV. He, I, in fact, introduced me uh, to the three guys who started it and, um, uh, and said, um, you're going to have to make music videos and lip sync. And I, I said, I, I actually, no, we're not going to do that. Um, and, um, and, he, and he, to his credit, uh, years later, I, I realized how kind of idiotic and bratty I was. I was 22 or 23 years old. And Is I that the only thing you ever promised never to do that you went ahead and did later? Well, I realized years later, uh, uh, so what, what happened was we, we did make music videos that were shown on MTV, but we did this kind of art school version of it. And, and, and because I didn't want to lip sync, it felt really fake and, and stupid. And, um, and we, you know, I wasn't going to have like girls dancing around me or anything like that unless <laughs> um, <laughs> and so we, we finally got to the point where I was lip syncing, but, but it took 11 years to do that. So w Losing My Religion was the first video that you ever did, or was there? A it's a f no, the, uh, in fact, to, to be completely truthful, now that YouTube can, um, can, uh, <laughs> can, can be yeah, can be accessed, uh, we, we, did a, we did a music video for a song on the first EP that we put out, uh, a song called Lower Wolves, and um, I'm, I think I'm lip syncing in that. And I, I just looked at it and thought, I look completely stupid. And you didn't appreciate the ironic, appreciate the ironic value of it, and kind of like what a young. No, it was just dumb, and <laughs> uh, I, I didn't want to participate in that. So we did, you know, for all intents and purposes, kind of art films until throughout the 1980s, and 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 um, and then uh, and then finally with losing my religion, I, I, I lip synced for the first time. How'd that feel? It felt great. I mean, it it, it worked. The 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 song had that kind of emotional pull. 
that, um, I mean, it was watching Sinead O'Connor do uh, Nothing Compares to You and being really very moved by her performance in that, in that video that, um, that changed my mind. Uh -huh. and, but it took me you know, 11 years to... I actually noticed on, on, on iTunes that the, the most popular R.E.M. song is still Losing My Religion, so obviously the video has paid dividends over the years. It's paid a lot of things. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> yeah. I'm really thankful for that song. So uh, how is it, now a number of the films that are on the, on that, that you've produced uh, for the new record and in, in, in new album include uh, mm -hmm. directors that you've worked with a bunch on other, um, uh, on other videos over the years. Mm -hmm. How is the work that they did for this different than what, you know, what, in terms of what you asked them to do? Did you give them greater license here where you're like, you know, this isn't a, this isn't a, a video, so there's different rules, or what, what was the kind of direction? Oh, yeah, had? I never answered that question. The, I, I, the, the idea of doing this um, was something that I'd wanted to do for a super long time, and then I realized, it kind of came to me slowly as we were making the record that I could actually go to these people that we had worked with time and time again, and who I had a great deal of respect for, and we had, uh, for lack of a, of, we had a, a little bit of a short, uh, uh, what's it called, uh, a language between us, uh, an understanding of what they do, me being able to kind of go, this is a song that this guy has a very, 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 very dry sense of humor. He makes my father seem like a comedian. And he would be perfect for this song. And so I, I, I took those two and put them together. Uh -huh. I'm speaking of Dominic De Joseph right. and the song um, Mind Smell Like Honey. And, um, and then Lance Bangs, who, who has this kind of weird upside down, uh, he works a lot with Spike Jones, um, the director, and, and he has this kind of upside down view of the world, and he's able to capture that in film. So Jackass, too, right? He's like Jackass, that's right. right. He's the guy who famously th uh, vomited uh, in a car. I just learned this because I don't watch Jackass, but he vomited in a Lance car. Himself? Lance vomited okay. in a car while being Three the cameraman, stars in and he never stopped filming. And so he's now <laughs> famous for that, <laughs> with, which is, I mean, this is, after all, America in the 21st century, so why not be famous for vomiting in a car? And, and so we're going to see that we're going to see that video. I think it's the first one we're going to watch, which we're not going to watch just a second. But now you're you're in a series of costumes in this video. Maybe we maybe you should just sort of prep that a little bit and tell us where those costumes come from and wh what was it like? I was hoping you're going to wear one of them tonight, but I don't. <laughs> they're really hot. I mean, I could have worn it with the weather today. What it is, but they're um, it's a, a Spanish uh, uh, designer named Isabel Mustache, and I saw her work online and I was really taken by it. She's known for what's called the penis pant pants which is a, uh, it's a suit that has uh, external male genitalia. And uh, so she got, she got shown Does she around. Did she sell those? I mean, do people, are, or just a conceptual piece? It was conceptual, right. highly, highly <laughs> conceptual. <laughs> uh, they actually looked really good from the front, but from the side they looked really bad. Um, uh, but I, 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 I reached out to her and, and said, I'm, 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 I'm shooting a series of, of films for my band's next record, and I'd, I'd love to borrow some of your clothes. And we got these two giant boxes sent to Berlin from Spain, and I was thrilled to be able to kind of represent. Well, with that, I guess what we should do is we're gonna we're gonna um, we're gonna queue up the first. We're gonna watch three videos in a row. We're gonna start um, with that video um, with alligator. With alligator. Aviator. We're gonna go to Oh My Heart, Absolutely. Jem Cohen, and then we're gonna go to Mine Smells Like Honey, Dominic De Joseph, which you just mentioned. So why don't we watch those three in a row, and then we'll start back with okay, the conversation. Okay, great. Fine.
kids have a new take, a new take on fame. Pick up the pieces, get carried away. I came home to say half erased. I came home to face what we face. Good of this world might help see me through. This place needs me here to start. This place is the beat.
<coughs> well, maybe we should work backwards and talk about you being um, folded up the stairs there or sort of thrown up the stairs. That yeah. was thrown up the stairs. Yeah, uh, well, the idea came from, I, I became, a, that that, uh, that was shot in Berlin. And in fact, the first and the second were shot in Berlin. And the second one was? Uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, the first and the third were shot in Berlin. And the, the second one, uh, Oh My Heart, the beautiful, sad song is shot in, uh, in uh, Vienna uh -huh. by Jim Cohen. So you started to say the idea for being rolled up the stairs was? I wanted, I liked the idea of falling down the stairs uh -huh. and uh, initially that was gonna happen, but I thought, uh, well, why not fall up the stairs instead? <laughs> and um, and the, it, it was kind of, you know, obviously I wind up in this kind of David Bowie lodger uh, position at the very end where I, th I think it's a cover of that album where it looks like he's been smashed into glass or thrown down an elevator shaft or something. And that's where that came from, but I was. So you started backwards kind of from the, from the idea of the cover of David Bowie's album? Or? No, I don't know. I honestly have no idea where it came from. Uh, it felt like uh, I, I wanted to pay homage to Buster Keaton uh -huh. a little bit. And so that's why I, I, I have that very blank face the whole time, uh, which I do anyway, <laughs> most of the time. But um, people really misread that. Anyway, I, 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 I thought it would be really funny and, 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 uh, and I thought it would match the song. Kind Were of you injured at all while that was happening? Yeah, How many times did they put you up the stairs? Did you just do it once? We did it once. You just once. Yeah, but it took four hours. Four uh, hours? And yeah. Well, one of the, it was uh, four men and one woman and uh, the woman and her, her boyfriend are both dancers. And then um, the, 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 one, the other guy is actually a massage therapist. So uh, <laughs> it was okay afterwards. <laughs> He worked on me, but they knew what they were doing, so they were really very athletic. And so these concepts then are pretty much yours that you collaborate with the directors on, or, or how did that? Um no, it's good that we it's good that we saw those first because in fact um, those are kind of I I brought uh, the band brought the band and one of others records our record company brought Dominic De Joseph and Lance Bangs to Berlin to film the band uh, performing. Uh, some of the new songs live in the studio. Mm -hmm. And the studio that we worked in is very famous um, for David Bowie having worked there and Iggy Pop and U2 and um, Snow Patrol and um, uh, other great artists have made great records there. So that's kind of why we chose it. But we brought those two guys in to, uh, to do an EPK, which is an uh, electronic press kit mm -hmm. where you talk to the camera about what the record's about. Is it the first one of those kinds of things that you've done or have you done those previous No, albums? I've done them forever. Uh -huh. and, then, uh, and then the band, more, kind of more significantly, the band performed uh, a bunch of the new songs live in a big room at Hansa studio. Uh -huh. And they filmed that. While they were there, they'd come all the way from the United States and I, s I had had this idea of, of um, working with Peaches, who's the woman uh, the amazing uh, electro electro clash is that what it's called? She's uh, she's an amazing singer songwriter from Canada who's Berlin based and a friend uh, for ten years. And we um, I, I brought her in to sing on that first song, kind of as the voice of testosterone. That's what I wanted her to be. <laughs> she was the voice of testosterone. She, yeah. Right. Well, uh, th those two uh, are the only ones that have me in it, and those two are the only ones where I, I went to Dominic uh, De Joseph for uh, Alligator Aviator Autopilot Antimatter and to Lance for um, Mind Smell Like Honey. I'm sorry, I reversed that. I went to those two guys uh, with this idea of falling up the stairs and wandering around uh, the kind of brutalist and modernist collapsed parts of Berlin with peaches in these outrageous costumes. And as part of the band dynamic, this is your end of it. They say, Michael, it's up to you. You make the films you want to make or? Peter Buck hates being filmed and photographed and he would he'd sooner chew his leg off than have to do another music video. You so should get him to wear one of those costumes and like well, around right. it. <laughs> they were really um, actually they were kind of high crotched and difficult uh, and hot. It was like the hottest day ever. But um, when we did that, but um, high crotch the pants, right? The pants, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> Peter, I, I'm sorry I didn't explain. Peter's very he's very tall. Okay. And I'm not. Right. So I was able to wear them uh, and he couldn't have possibly but that's a good idea. I should yeah, have thought yeah. of that. Um, so, so the, uh, the 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 middle video then in Vienna. How did that? So you guys just went to Vienna for the day, and why there? No, the band has nothing to do with it. Um, I I I went to that song with. I, I went to. I mean, keep in mind, every single person that we worked with for this project are people who I'm enormous. I'm an enormous fan of their work, and mm -hmm. so to be able to collaborate or to be able to bring them in and say and basically say, do what you do, like whatever you want to do. It's an art film. It doesn't have to be a music video. It doesn't have to be anything except what you want. And free reign, here you go. That was such a thrill for me 
as an artist to be able to num number one find these people and, and ask them if they would like to work with us but number two give them free reign over what whatever they wanted to do I hate to ask such a crass question but in this era where the record companies don't sell any yeah. albums anymore and um, where does the budget for things like this come from very low uh -huh. and um and but it's also you know it's it's, it's quite easy with um, with uh, available technology to shoot a, a three or four minute film and have it not cost what it w might have cost 10 years ago. Right. Um, significant also, and I don't think it's really been talked about much, but the first film and the second film were, um, um, yeah, th th those two songs were, th I, I wound up, you know, when you write, um, when I write, I never quite know what I'm gonna write about. And sometimes I'm surprised by what comes out. Um, I wrote three songs, which I, which I named the Testosterone Trilogy, and it was really about um, what it is to be a man. And a kind of- Are those those three songs? Well, no. Uh, the first one is, uh, and it, it, it really embodies, like for me, w what it is to be a teenager uh, at the mall, um, on the escalator. I, the the line is like, I feel like an alligator, and it's like this raging, insane feeling of uh, of immortality, and you know, you just want to fuck anything, and um, and and you you have all these things that you've never felt before. So I wanted to somehow capture that. Uh, not only in the lyric, but also in the in the in the in the, in, in, in the film piece, the third. But it's much moodier. The the the, the um, I mean, I like the I like the difference between you and that in those crazy costumes, and they're completely droll and like yeah. you know, and and so you don't get that sense of. I mean, the lyrics say that. Well, I'm 51, so I can't play a teenager. I mean, I wanted a teenager to do it, in fact, but um, but then I just did it myself. Right. Yeah. I don't know why, but I I I. I um, and then the third one is uh, Mind Smell Like Honey. It's the guy's kind of in, probably in his late 20s and he still thinks he ru rules the world. I mean, it's really just about those, that inner turmoil of being a guy and the, the crazy insecurities that come along with that. Well, let's talk about technology for a second. You sure. mentioned it. Um, I was, uh, we were talking about this before in the green room. You don't, you're not on Twitter. You do have a Tumblr page though. What do you what do you what do you do on Tumblr? I I I, I know I, I looked at it, but I'm I'm oh yeah. to see have you describe it to people and well, for what the your most project part, is there. My the Tumblr the Tumblr site that I have is called Confessions of a Michael com, and what it is is basically my studio and what what I'm working on or what I'm thinking about or the kind of stuff that I'm gathering for different sculpture projects that I'm that I'm uh, that I'm working on. Can you describe some of those, those uh, sculpture projects? Um, There's a thing about corners. I'm trying to think of the last thing that I did. Yeah, I'm really obsessed with corners. And um, so I've been photographing them for about three years. And I'm, I'm, I'm making these, uh, well, I call them sculptures, but I don't really know what they are, in fact. I don't know, but they kind of look like paintings, but they're not. And um, they're flat, and they go on the wall. And they're. So what's sculptural about them? They're flat, and they go on a wall? Well, it's not a painting. It's not a drawing. OK. It's not a photograph, but it's, but it's, it's you can hold it. So it's uh, a sculpture. If I if I say it's sculpture, then it's sculpture. Yeah, you're right. So yeah. <laughs> it's, it's sculpture. You you said you, you told uh, you told uh, T Magazine, the New York Times T Magazine, yeah. that you were um, uh, going to open a pop up shop. No, uh, I don't. I didn't think you were really serious. Although that was kind of an exciting idea. Um, that's not going to happen. No, I despise the term actually. Oh uh, really? I, yeah. Uh, so I would never do that ever, ever, ever. Oh. I I thought it would be a cool idea. Like to tell. I want to sell wallpaper, and so that might happen. At a but not at a pop-up shop. No. No. Okay. Um, <laughs> what, what about what about other technology and 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 the the way you use it? Do you own an iPad? I do, but I it's, I mean I, I don't even I, it just gathers dust. It's a totally useless piece of uh, machinery, uh, if you ask me. And I love Apple, and I really kind of like everything that they do. Um, but between my iPhone and my laptop, I, the iPad is just like you know like an extra leg i mean who needs it what what is your what is your like your like media consumption on your on your on your phone or your on your pretty hardcore give yeah. me an example like what's but something you need to check every day or oh uh well email i mean <laughs> 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 we all do that that's not very interesting but um you want to read us any of your good emails <laughs> I love it. you know my phone's being charged in the back and uh luckily but is there is there uh, we we're we we're talking politics a little bit talking about um, are there political things that you read all the time yeah. or that, that are important to you? Yeah, I keep up with the news a real lot, and you can't live in New York and not. I mean, I think all of us just kind of absorb what's happening in the world because of this being such a kind of media center. Um, I but I, I really keep up with um, I try to keep up with what's happening a real lot, and then but not through Twitter. I mean, I I, I no offense. I, th I met the guy the other, uh, I met the guy on Saturday who started Twitter actually, and I had met him before, he's a nice guy. Uh -huh. But um, 
I, I, I don't find it particularly interesting. Uh, yeah. Now, some of your, your, your friend Patty Smith has a book that she did that uh, people are talking about a lot. Keith Richards has a, a book that has been a big deal. He's not my friend, <laughs> but, <laughs> I, I, but I admire him. Um, is that something that you might be interested in doing sometime? No, why not, not really? <laughs> I mean, it, it's nice to have people laughing when I talk because no, people always think I'm so serious, but I really, frankly, don't think I'm that interesting or that my life, I mean, I love my life so much and I, I you know, I love the people that are in my life and I love the opportunities that are presented to me through being an artist and having uh, achieved whatever we've achieved as a band and whatever I've achieved outside of that. I, I, I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. Um, but I don't think it would make a very good read. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Patty, on the other hand, has you know provided pr probably by a show of hands. I'm guessing everyone in this room has read Just Kids. It's an amazing book, ostensibly about her and Robert, but really I think it's about an era, and uh, and it captures something about that era that that um, that no nobody has really managed to do. Or it, I think it reminds people that were actually there. Mm -hmm the feelings that they had when they were there instead of the feelings that w they were told to have later. But that kind of project doesn't interest you because, I mean, you lived through an era that I think people are really curious about. Um, well, for one thing, I'm not a kiss and tell kind of guy. Uh -huh. Not that Patty is or that Keith Richard is. I didn't read his book, so I don't know. Uh -huh. But um, uh, I, I, there, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm a fairly private person. and I'm really, you know, I, 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 I just don't think I'd be, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to start blushing now, but I don't think I'd make... I, I, I just don't think, I don't, I, 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 you know, I can't think about it. Okay. Yeah. But, you know what? <laughs> Let's not talk Let's about not, it yeah. anymore. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, we're going to watch two more videos, one of which is Michael's own video um, to discover, but the first one is Every Day is Yours to Win. Um, and uh, we'll watch those, and then we'll talk about them, and then we'll get to the last two, which are really, I just saw for the first time a few minutes ago, and really amazing. Oh, All of them are amazing, but I think you'll be particularly delighted by the last one, too, so we want to make sure we get Thank to that. You. So. All right.
I hope you guys do play again live soon because that would be a pretty good song to hear you guys. That's play. a great song. That's yeah, good. It's really nice. Yeah. Um, so we, uh, uh, these videos are all films are all playing at the Clock Tower Gallery. That's right. And how they are they playing sort of discontinuously there? Is that how it works? The Clock Tower is. Uh, it's yeah. Is it Leonard? I think so. It's Elmworth Leonard. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> the Clock Tower Gallery is this amazing place where um, anyway the the films are showing tomorrow and uh, and Friday is the last day. And they're open from 12 to 5. So if anybody wants to see these again, uh, large scale, um, it's a really beautiful space. And I'm really proud to have participated in that, in that show. Now, how did you envision people seeing them? Um, when you were did you think about that, like how people are going to watch these? Because um, there's obviously not movie theaters. On, their, on devices. On devices. Yeah. Um, and did you sort of test them on that just to see what the experience was? And yeah. what was your bet? I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, I, it's really great to see them this big. I've only seen them. Honestly, every time I've done this, I've had to kind of crane my neck, uh -huh. and um, it, it's really distorted from here, as you can tell. Right, right. So, <sighs> that first one, the um, that we just saw right now, the uh, Every oh, Day Is Yours to Win. Oh, yeah. Tell me, who are those people? Beautiful. They're all off of YouTube, and um, so you found all those people, and then I didn't. Right, but uh, they were found. Yeah, I went to Jim McKay, uh -huh. uh, my my best friend and uh, an amazing director, and uh, and he he and I are working uh, with. Uh, two artists who are making a documentary film um, about the internet uh, using, uh, as a catalyst for that, using uh, Chris Crocker. And, um, uh, and so they've been shooting this documentary about him, uh, Chris McCarble and Valerie Veach. And Jim McKay, Chris, and Valerie uh, worked on Every Day is Yours to Win. Uh -huh. They kind of basically just pulled everything that they could find from 
YouTube and tried to um, uh, tried to kind of follow. I think what the the song "Every Day Is Yours to Win." It's a little bit of it's like a it's like a song for a sad day when you're not feeling very good about yourself, and um, it's a little bit about uh, success and what what success means internally. So, so those are the straight found taken from YouTube that they clipped together and edited. And that's right. right. That, yeah, and and the list at the end is all the people. Uh, the, the really big guy with the with the makeup who's on the couch with his legs up uh, is from the Bronx. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> like, had you heard of REM before this? Do you think? I don't know if they I don't know if they had or not. I mean, a lot of them are are you know are, are younger or right. I mean it's a big world out there. So I'm never <laughs> offended when people don't know what I do. Right. Yeah. It's it's cool. And then and the second one, the one you did, you did with your sister. Right. That uses sort of CAD software. Uh, AutoCAD. AutoCAD. Yeah. And how, where did that idea develop? Is your sister an architect? She, she's working in design, and uh -huh. she's been taking courses. Uh, she's actually an artist, and um, uh, but she, she became really interested in design work. And so she's been taking these, uh, these courses and getting, getting a degree. And um, she works in AutoCAD, which is this very dry, kind of, I think, an interesting particularly to architects, right. an, an interesting tool, but we just bastardized the hell out of it. And uh -huh. I, I, she, um, she has a band called Flash to Bang Time, and she was, say, she was showing me um, this stuff that she could do where you can make it turn around and you can zoom through something, and it's this beautiful vanishing point that goes on and on and on forever, uh -huh. which is one of the main themes of this record, right. uh, uh -huh. Collapse into Now. And so when she showed it to me, I, I my head like exploded and I, I, I said, do you think that you could keep 80% of that idea for yourself and I could have 20% and we could make a film for R.E.M. together? So she's got 80% that she's yeah. working on, right? And is she a New Yorker? Is she someone you are? That she lives in Athens, Georgia. Uh -huh. And actually the band performed at South by Southwest uh, where I did a, a talk similar to this. And um, uh, I got to see them do the, uh, the AutoCAD uh, live for the first time. Uh, and it looked amazing. Uh -huh. Yeah. Now tell me about that song. The song is sort of a, a we were discussing a little earlier. It's a song about New York City. It's yeah, sort of very a love much. letter to New York. It's my yeah. It's like my Valentine to New York, and um, it's really about coming here as a very young man and uh, and feeling the the. I mean, New York kind of has that thing. Of course, we all know. I think, but that that you feel this unbelievable energetic push and and this this sense of of endless possibilities and opportunity. And uh, how old were you when you first came to New York? 19 in um, <laughs> banana yellow wide roll corduroy pants, eye makeup, and g these green shoes that I bought at a thrift store. And I thought I was, I thought I was a cat's pajamas. I was, I was so punk rock and handsome. And I, you know, <laughs> and I got here and it was like not, this, uh, not the case. I mean, I was such, so, I was such a like country bumpkin, but, um, <laughs> but, um, but uh, New York. Did you come by yourself and friends? No, I came with Peter Buck from REM and uh, and three other friends. We came up in a in a van before you were th and before the band had begun. Before the band, yeah. Peter and I had forged a friendship, and I was trying really hard to get him to to, s to start a band together. Uh huh. And he and didn't um, want to. No, he didn't want to. Because he said all guitar players are assholes. <laughs> and did and he know how to play guitar at that point or no? No. no. I mean, he w he would he he worked at a record store and he would right. kind of pick uh, a guitar uh, behind the desk and just scowl at people as they walked in. And, and I Those thought- Those guys have all disappeared, the scowling record store clerks. What's <laughs> happened to them? Oh, no. <laughs> no, <they're, laughs> no, they haven't They all have funny names, and they make comments on the, on the internet now. Yeah. yeah. That's true, actually. In yeah. fact, there's more of them than ever. I forgot. That's true. They just, you don't see them. Yeah. Um, so you came to New York with Peter, and then you returned in I returned. Well, we came. Jim Farratt was a huge proponent of, of uh, a, a, a huge, uh, 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 not collaborative. Uh, proponent? No, uh, I don't know what that means. In fact, oh, sounds right. He um, he was he a huge he was a huge supporter of okay. REM in the early days, and he brought us he brought us up. Um, first, we played the Pilgrim Theater in Alphabet City with a bunch of other bands, and then he had us open Danceteria when it reopened, and then we opened for the Cramps on um, Halloween, uh, where I was wearing a pink gingham bunny suit with uh, with, and we only did songs about death. On Halloween, so it was really awesome. But <laughs> I, I have Jim Farratt to thank for that. Is and there any remnant of that? You're like a. There's a single photograph that I know of. Laura Levine shot a picture. Um, in the bunny suit. The great photographer Laura Levine of me in the in the pink gingham bunny suit uh -huh. doing songs about death, with the cramps and the gang of four in the background. It's pretty wild. 
So that first trip to New York, is, so was that the first trip to New York as the band in 1982, or is that? No, it would have been 80, I think. Probably 80 was the first time we came. Okay. 81, maybe. Um, but it was, it was around that sometime, like around, I'm, I'm going to guess it was 83 or 84. We were coming here a lot, and we were living uh, at the Iroquois uh, Hotel on 44th between 5th and 6th, which is where James Dean lived when he was studying acting. And, um, and uh, I, I, I would wander the streets because I, I, I couldn't afford cabs. I couldn't afford the subway. I couldn't afford food. I couldn't afford anything. I was really poor. And I would just wander around and kind of take in, take in the city. And that's, that's when the song came from a particular night when I discovered that if you combine vodka and espresso, um, it, it, you get really uh, up and you're totally aware of how up you are. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Discover was, is autobiographic. And that's a, that's a way that I don't write very often at all. Um, but the the song and the, the song and the feeling reminded me of those first visits to New York and how the city really offered me this immense possibility that I had never really felt anywhere else in my life. And it's why I'm here. It's why I live here. And it's why I, I think New York will always be a part of my, uh, a part of certainly the work that I do as a, as an artist or as a, as a songwriter. Um, and, uh, and hopefully a part of my life, uh, you know, directly. Thank you. Thank you yeah, very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good job, Michael. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs>